So with uh, further ado, here's the PCI compromise and controls and compromise and security talk. All right, it's before noon, so good morning. Uh, thanks for coming out. Uh, my name is Jack Daniel, for those that don't know me. For those that do, you may be wondering where the sock puppets are. Last time I saw them, they were drunk on the beach at B-Side, so this is not one of my sock puppet talks. So, PCI at DEF CON. Uh, what the hell has the world come to? <laughs> it's noon on Sunday at DEF CON, and people are interested in this, and I don't think I have to read this. This is changing the security industry. Those of us that care about security, those of us that like to play with stuff, this, this compliance thing is uh, getting into everything we do. And PCI is the poster child for it. It's global. It has a, a significant impact on a lot of things. And so you can extrapolate this to HIPAA, Sarbanes-Oxley, and different firm forms, but we're going to pick on PCI because uh, it's fun. And Nevada state law. But still, it is PCI at DEF CON, and it does seem like a sign of the end times, you know, six horsemen of the apocalypse here. Actually, seven, but we'll get to that in a moment. Who are we? Uh, James Arlen, Mercurial, I'm sure most of you know him. Anton Chivakin, uh, Dr. Chivakin was not able to join us in person, but his book's here. Uh, anytime you think Anton should comment, just say, buy my book. Um, it's actually a good book, but uh, he's been involved in this since the beginning. Joshua Corman, uh, me, Alex Hutton, Martin McKay, and Mr. David Shackelford. So, usual disclaimers. We don't speak for our employers, clients, customers, spouses, siblings, or offspring. My dog will back me up, but that's because just uh, she gets truck rides and that's it. Opinions are our own. Facts are as we see them. Uh, we aren't lawyers, etc. And should anyone on the panel be a QSA, they are not your QSA. <laughs> Maybe not. And, you. and I would actually amend that, that, I, that if there's a QSA or two on the panel, they might be your QSA. <laughs> At least for a few of you. So, uh, discussions. These typically deteriorate into cliches. Any discussion, somebody inevitably says, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. I have one word for that, don't make me say, much less show Tub Girl. Ooh. <laughs> so if this becomes a slugfest, I'm going to moderate this, but I'm going to be the salt because we do have some people with different opinions. So here we go. This started with, uh, it's, it's going on, but uh, Josh Corman made some comments that lit some people up. And we've had an ongoing discussion that's uh, coming to almost a year. And the, the, the standard questions are, you know, is, is it PCI or security? Is it really versus security? Uh, at some levels, PCI actually hampers security for the advanced. PCI also advances security for the people that aren't doing what they should be in the first place. I mean, I work for a firewall vendor. There are people that have rudimentary things uh, because they're required to. But there are also other, there's the other end of that. And we have pretty pictures to point to that. And it has an impact on all of us. It has an impact on what it costs to use your credit card. It has an impact on what it costs to buy things somewhere where they have to be PCI compliant. It has an impact on whether or not you have fraud charges on your card. So there's the obligatory first boring bell curve slide, and then there's Mr. Corman. <laughs> okay, so um, this thing basically started when uh, Chris Hoff and I were doing a bunch of roundtables with CISOs, and we were doing them for two days on virtualization as a disruptive technology, cloud computing as a disruptive technology, deed and reparameterization, mobility, and we're basically showing how traditional security architectures were ill-suited for a rapidly changing compute environment. We weren't even talking about bad guys. And we kind of did a tabula rasa project and drew on the whiteboard, if you could start over, what security controls would you keep? Which ones would you toss? You know, we just carry behind this comet trail of dead technologies that do a really, really bad job. And uh, what would it look like? So at the end of the day, someone raised their hand and said, oh my god, I don't need to buy that anymore. I don't need to buy that anymore. And some other guy stood up in the back room and said, but damn it, PCI still makes me buy that crap. So the next morning after lots of caffeine, I think two hoppuccinos, I said, you know, PCI is the devil. And I got a standing ovation from like 200 CISOs. And it was really a joke, right? But uh, when Anton and Martin heard it, they wanted to uh, exercise the demons. And we started a, a pretty adult 
informed and clueful debate because people basically hate PCI for a visceral reason, or they love PCI and they're fanboy and they write books about it. Um, but <laughs> or just, just, just to be clear, by adult he does not mean pantsless. That's right. We were miles and miles apart, and some of us don't like PCI but make a living at it. That's true. So the bottom line was we're having all these food fights and they're not helpful. Right? It's just the echo chamber. So we wanted to have adult and rational debate, and what happened was the people who tended to like it saw a bell curve. So now I don't call it the devil, I call it the No Child Left Behind Act for security. <laughs> because there is, in fact, a distribution, right? You have the people who do nothing, and that's basically where PCI has been very helpful, the negligent. They would do absolutely no security for that card data, were they not forced and fined to do so. But then you have a lot of people that were doing security well before we could spell PCI, and they are not, they're nonplussed by this. They didn't get extra budget. They got distracted, right? So you have the, the, the negligent, the advanced, and a lot of people in the middle. And what we found is the people who were fanboys were really describing a different segment, the people who must be forced to do something. And the people who were upset with it killing innovation or redirecting budget were the people in the middle or on the higher end. Now, Martin really enhanced this view because it's more like this. Martin? I did? Yeah. Well, we've had the conversation many times, and, and I think Josh just kind of summed it up, that there really are a, a, a two distinct groups of people. And, and as he said, there's the, the majority of the people that, that I see as a QSA that are have a rudimentary security system, have rudimentary um, controls in place, but there's still things that, that would be considered basic and common sense that are not there. They just either haven't had the budget, they haven't had the time, for whatever reason, there's lots of controls in place that for years they've never had the time to put. And that's the people in the first hump there that really just have to have some sort of, of lever to get management to give them the money to actually secure the enterprise. And that's, even though I don't like everything about PCI, that's one of the best things I see about it is it's, a, it's an opportunity for people to use as a lever against management. On the other hand, if you really look at PCI, I'm the one, I, I'm the one person your managers fear more than hackers. Think about it. I'm the one who can come in and say, you know what? I don't think you're compliant here. Therefore, you're going to have to end up paying an extra half a cent per char per transaction, or you're going to have to pay an extra percent per tra 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 per transaction um, because you didn't mark the check boxes. It's not perfect, but it has done a lot of, of changes and made people get that money and get those resources. <laughs> Do you have any uh, thoughts on this, uh, Jamie? Well, let's see. We've created a system that requires that you pay extra money in order to solve a problem that isn't your problem. Does anyone know what that's called in the uh, in, in the in the law? Extortion. Extortion. Racketeering. <laughs> There's a specific set of laws that are designed to prevent that. Is that Canadian or U.S. law? Uh, that's everybody's law. Here's the deal. You've got a situation in which a bunch of people with lots of money are making the suggestion that 100,000 merchants are going to do a better job at securing the credit card transactional system than the three credit card companies can do. Come again? It's an insane solution to a very, very simple problem. I want everybody in the room to spend just a few minutes thinking about what usury is. <laughs> There's a legal definition for it. The legal definition for it does not include something that I think is very apropos these days. I want you to think about the spread between the overnight interest rate and what you pay on your credit card interest rate. The average in North America is over 20% for credit card interest. The average overnight rate is under one half of 1%. When you follow the money, you can't find it. 20% interest 
nearly 20% interest, is disappearing into covering the costs of the credit card transactional system, which was designed in the 50s, has yet to be significantly updated. There's a problem there. Why is it up to all of us to solve it? Jack, they're quiet. They might be thinking. I, I don't have to think. I've got a checklist, and if I fill it out, it's solved. <laughs> I'm going to hijack this for just a second, because I, I, this is a point that uh, somebody that's not on this panel but has been involved in the conversation brought up about that uh, thought and checklist, which is um, Andy Ellis, who uh, some of you may know, uh, he, he has a uh, security off job CSO for uh, Akamai, and uh, he observed that a lot of us, at least those of us that are on the, the admin side that made it into the security world, uh, something went wrong, we moved up the food chain from doing desktop support to being network or systems admins, or maybe if you're like me in small business, you were network and systems admin, and something went wrong, something got popped, you became involved in security, you became the security guy, you know the system nuts and bolts up, you got in that entry level security position and moved up. That entry level security position is now somebody that's out of uh, community college with a two year accounting degree because they need to audit a checklist. So now where do we get those entry level people? We've broken this path. And I don't know that that's universally true, but after thinking about it and talking to some other people, that's absolutely true. I should have said at the beginning we're going to try to hold questions to the end, but while you're standing there, you have some. Good morning. Thank you. You're assuming that the problem you describe is the problem that the card companies are trying to solve. And what they're really <laughs> trying to do is shift the perception, the liability to the merchants, the acquirers, everybody else, because otherwise, if they take control of the system and there's a failure, people lose confidence in the card system itself. Now they can point to individual merchants, processors, whatever, and say, we have this great standard, and they failed to meet it, they were not compliant at the time of the breach, and so they're protecting themselves and their system. Wait, wait, so you mean a financial institution or a group of financial institutions made a conscious decision to transfer risk so that they can maximize their profits? Isn't, isn't that amazing? <laughs> but, but the risk... Uh, uh, apologies for interrupting. Carry on. So, so did you just call PCI the um, <laughs> a faulty financial instrument? Is that is that the analogy? But, well, I, I did. Uh, is your network a toxic mortgage, sir? <laughs> okay. So uh, because you you pointed at me when you said that, I don't want to run the entire audience through the history of the credit card system and the number of times that they've done risk transferal down one level. Uh, when they started, when they began the process of creating the quid pro quo that turned the credit card into the instrument of world economics. And they are the de facto world currency. Well, but but let's, let's be serious. Even that risk transference wasn't really the main reason behind PCI. That was kind of nice for them, but for the PCI council, for the credit card companies, at least in my opinion, it was really all about keeping the government out of their business. <laughs> PCI. It's, it's, it's basically a way of saying, look, we're doing something. We're trying our best to make sure that this is secure and that your transactions are, are taken care of and kept secure. Look, Mr. President, stay away from us. We don't want to see you. We don't want to see Congress. Thanks. Bye. If I, if I, my, uh, I was just going to say, we have, we have a really scary situation. Dave Shackelford has been quiet for uh, several minutes. Yeah, and we need to resolve that. That's absolute madness. But, I mean, you know, so let me just, I mean, I'll just call kind of the bullshit on the, the, the you know, conversation. I mean, we can all clap and go, you know, yeah, you know, F the man, whatever, right? But, yeah, and woo, woo, I'm talking about. But what's the debate? Are, are we going to change any of that? We can sit here and talk shit all day long. We're not going to change that. So the question is, do we need a better checklist? Or do we need better auditors? 
we need, you know, some controls around how it gets done. I, I mean, I guess, you know, the question is, you know, you said it at the beginning, Jack, we're talking PCI today. Uh, how many of you have been dealing with compliance crap for a long time? Come on, all of you. Right? Every one of you. I mean, I can literally remember when socks got created, and as a technical guy, you know, my stomach just churned because I'm like creating these mounds of paper that meant nothing. And so the, the thing is, those aren't going to go away. So what can we do to make the thing better? I mean, the government's going to stay involved. The, uh, the industry entities are going to stay involved. And I'll pause there. All right, you actually brought something. I'd kind of like to know. Um, you can. You don't have to. It's Defcon. I'd like to know what the mix of the audience is. How many? Are, how many people are pen testers in the audience or, or vault assessment? Cool. Um, how about uh, people that, that are just compliance wonks? One way or another, have gotten sucked into compliance as a career. Nobody's raising. Oh, I got a few. Look at that. <laughs> just as many as claim they know how to penetrate things. Yeah. How about uh, general purpose network or systems admin folk? We, we have an interesting mix, and you're all interested in PCI. I mean, I'm a packet monkey, and I've ter been turned into a compliance guy because of what Dave said. This stuff, you can't get away from it. You cannot get away from it. So where do we go? Well, I mean, we can't keep screaming into the darkness, right? You can't just be pissed off that this is here. What we should be pissed off about, to Dave's point, it's the content, right? So what that checklist looks like sucks. The average skill set uh, is going down in a lot of the QSA. Some of the QSA shops are downright corrupt. They'll fail you and then sell you the, the passing grade. So it's really not about getting rid of the system. It's really about, you know, we're going to have some sort of compliance process. It's structure and content, and the content sucks. The reason we have grandma on the end there, and I didn't have to make fun of the PCI council. They did it themselves. That's the PCI Rocks video on YouTube, and if you haven't seen it yet, you oh. need to experience this. Hilarity ensues. Yes, in fact, in fact, the reason the Anton isn't pick here is we... Pick up some acid in the hall while you're here this weekend and watch <laughs> that, because it, it might yeah. make sense in that context. One of the reasons Anton may not be here, we could speculate, is because we, we made him promise that if we got accepted, he would do an interpretive dance to the PCI video. But the bottom line is that, that grandma there is the antivirus grandma. And we have our oldest like control. Antivirus. Antivirus, that's right. But, uh, the, exactly. uh, uh. but what we've codified is we're making sure people spend on the digital dozen, right? The dirty dozen. And if you look at that list, it's firewall. How many of you guys would be stopped by a firewall? IDS, not even IPS. I mean, the, the Gartner Magic Geometry leader for IPS got a 14% score after they tuned for two for two days in the NSS test labs, but I have a compensating control for that. Well, it's going to be compromised. <laughs> but these things are—they're not useless, but they're really long in the tooth. And what we have is an incredibly static set of controls and best practices designed several years ago that never change. Right? Well, and it gets worse. Now we're coming up with 1.3 or 2.0 of the PCI DSS. They're going from a two-year life cycle to a three-year life cycle. They're trying to make it so that every Everything is going to be along the same uh, the same date time. Uh, we are not expecting to see major changes from 1.2 to 1.3. We're not seeing a lot of new information. So, how do we use this tool? I mean, really, PCI is an assessment. Is a, I'm sorry, a compliance tool instead of just something we have to check. Uh, check boxes off, and that's that's one of the problems we have is that we keep thinking of it as a checklist instead of a tool to make management do what we want. I mean, if we have changes, look at all this, the great talks you saw at Black Hat and these sides and DEF CON. Look at all these people dropping new research. Do you think any of that research is going to affect the standard? Well, it certainly isn't going to make it in October, and the next chance to do so is three years from now. But, but we do have reliable guidance on how to secure our virtual and cloud infrastructures. And this uh, being scoped the way it is actually secures our entire infrastructure because no, wait. All they care about is uh, magstripe data. Wait, why are we using magstripes? That goes back to our 50s technology uh, idea. So, uh, you know, this there's, one of, the, the there's one of the issues is we have something that isn't going to do a good job. This is an argument I got into over the Massachusetts 201 CMR 17. Uh, it's the law that was enacted after TJX came out. We had a breach disclosure law that required the state to push out a law 
or a set of guidelines which had some sort of penalty if you didn't follow them, although there's no enforcement, does that sound familiar, for how to protect your systems. And it got watered down and watered down and watered down. And I stood up at a hearing and said, you know, this is garbage. What you should do is just jack the fines through the roof and let risk take its place because anybody can work, they can talk their way around any of these, you know, encryption, it just is a horrible rule. And somebody got up after me and said that if you make a good faith effort at this, and I threw up my mouth a little bit, because if the businesses made a good faith effort in security, we wouldn't be here. But on the flip side, having worked in small and mid-sized businesses all my life, there are this, there's a series of problems. If I don't make payroll on Friday, then it's all over. And in security, we are notorious for losing sight of that. If we don't make payroll, if we don't do X, if we're publicly traded, so th there really is this heavy financials constraint. And if PCI frees up budget, and at first, that seemed like a really good idea. And I think we've now crossed the, the, pump, crossed the line with some of the um, people where they're really being held back and there's some other things when we talk you brought up the quality of people I, I, those of you that have dealt with external scans or QSAs who maybe uh, weren't you know, skilled or ethical or either one you know, I mean, you know what you're let, me, let me ask you a question really quick hey, this is probably as honest a group of people in a room I think as we'll probably get <laughs> just guessing how many of you are brave enough or are possibly willing to, to raise your hand and say you have benefited from PCI. There's got to be a few. Oh yeah, there are. Look at that. <laughs> there are, in fact, a fair number of folks in this room that would say we've benefited. Is it is it budget? Is it better security? Is it better living through checkboxes? <laughs> jobs, jobs, security, jobs, rock and well, roll, let, right? So let's, honest let's, people. Let's look Good at the job. other side of it. How many people have had projects turned down because they're not PCI related or, or because, and really think it's because they were not PCI related, not because your manager was just giving you a, a solid excuse? Yeah. yeah, I mean, so this is a really important point. So far we've been talking about you know, the tonality or the design, but I mean, from my purview, when, in my last job I did this massive market survey and we basically counted 70 different security product markets with their own compound annual growth rates, right? 70. And that's way too many, right? It's an abject fail that we needed 70 to begin with. But if you look at which ones are required by PCI, there's nine of them. So what happened was the economy took a nosedive. You saw nine winners and a whole lot of losers. And a lot of my clients at the time, now a lot of my new clients, they're basically saying, look, I go to my boss, I want to do a DLP project or a network forensics project or this or that, and their boss says, will I be fined if I don't do it? If the answer is no, then you don't get the budget. So it's not that there's no spending beyond those nine, but most of those nine, as I said before, are old, busted, stuff near retirement. And a lot of the new, more modern projects for a new, more modern adversary or for evolutions in virtualization or cloud or whatever you got to do differently as your business has changed, if you won't be at fine, you basically don't get a budget. So, you know, I mean, it scares me because what that does is it, it financially rewards laggard technologies and it financially disincents innovative folks here trying to do startups, trying to do bootstraps, VC-based, whatever. And if there's no buyer for this innovative stuff, or if it's only that small secondary double hump, it's not that there's no market. It's that if you're on that list of nine, you're eating at the buffet table in the banquet hall. And if you're not in that nine, then you're begging for scraps in the streets. So I'm concerned about the long-term impact of too much money being spent on really old stuff at the cost of us focusing on what we used to try to do, even if we did a bad job, try to figure out the biggest risks in our environment and mitigate them with the best of, to the best of our ability. That's not the conversation anymore. It's we fear the auditor more than the attacker. I've got another quick question, just kind of along the same lines, right? So like, how many of you folks generally agree, I'm like the question asking guy on the panel, right? But, uh, you know, hey, generally, hey, we don't have any answers up here, so we might as well ask yeah, questions. Yeah, I'm, I'm throwing it out, right? I mean, again, but I mean, generally speaking, wouldn't, wouldn't most of you agree that, uh, you know, exploitable vulnerabilities, aside from physical types of vulnerabilities, are, are typically code related? Yeah, I mean, generally speaking, it's the code. So how the hell do you get to a web application firewall and a really thorough code review being equivalent? Thorough code review? 
Well, um, it's, not, it's not required to be no, no, thorough. No, no, right on. I mean, that, that's what I'm saying. You know, enter PCI, you know, if, I, if I'm an uneducated, non-security background auditor coming through with the checkbox, I can take either one, check you off. I was going to try to avoid jumping in a all of this, a lot of this myself and moderate, but the, the, the code review. So here's one of the things about PCI that drives me nuts, and that's it. It's that, that, that code review versus WAF, it, right? and it, it's not what it says. It doesn't say you can't have both, but the way it's framed, and it's largely just misinterpretation, and that's part of what we've been trying to do in the past year is get people to think about it, get people educated, but it's... People have now decided because they only need one, they only have to budget one, and the people that work in web app security hopefully would agree with me that if you want to secure your web apps, you're going to make your code as clean as possible, and you'll probably put a WAF in front of it just in case you miss something dumb. And then you find something, yeah, yeah, you can pimp rugged later, then you find something and you go to that web app firewall, it's just like we do on the network side. When you go to your IDS, you go to your web app firewall and you say, hey, I got this problem and until the code gets fixed, I gotta make sure this doesn't get through. You put them together, they're complementary technology. PCI, intentionally or otherwise, sets them up as competing. And there, there are several other places where the things that just get back and forth and yeah, I'm hoping we get to this with Alex, but uh, you know, yeah, he was starting to open his mouth. So I think, um, let Alex say something, and then we have a gentleman. Yeah, this nice gentleman's been standing there. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. He's got something important to say. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Good morning. I think that when we talk about PCI, we need to talk at two levels. One is what we're forced to do at the bank or merchant or service provider level. But I think you're missing a larger point, which is the PCI council level. I agree with the gentleman who said that the fundamental driver for PCI is that the credit card companies want to transfer risk and liability down a level or two. And at the same time, they're trying to say that they are autonomous, and therefore they're making an independent standard like ISO or whatever. But at the same time, they have a symbiotic relationship with their business partners, which are the banks and the merchants. And how many times have we seen a vulnerability like with TJ or whatever, or Hanford, which results in discussion about a new control. They put out a draft comment or some draft guidance, and all of a sudden, when it becomes real, it gets watered down because so there's been negative feedback. Oh my God, it's going to be too expensive or it's going to be too complex. So you're, you're yeah, okay, so. When you look at PCI, you know, when you try and look at everything, at, at the risk of making the complex simple, we really only have three issues, and I'm kind of getting into slides and stuff later, but that's all right. right. The first issue is, is it the right thing for the card companies to do? Well, like it or not, unless you go to your congressman, and they're actually they're going to be able to buy the votes better than you can, so you're screwed anyway. But that, we don't have any control over that. We won't have any control over that. The second is, I'll, I'll call it a microcosmic view, Right, if you think the difference between microeconomics and macroeconomics, can PCI, can the DSS, can the various uh, you know standard bot, uh, standard documents do exactly what they say they can, they think they can do? In a sense, each document they create is a model, and it says we think that some outcome will arrive if this happens, right? And then the third, and the third problem is on a on a kind of a macrocosmic view, right? Is are we creating things that will will fundamentally change the future in ways that we don't know? Okay, and and that's because what you're looking at is is complex systems. And in fact, the answer to your code review versus uh, web application firewall is it doesn't freaking matter. It doesn't freaking matter because. If you take and isolate any one control out of a control systems that you use to manage a network or group of systems or whatever you're doing, or, or creating a product or what have you, um, you're, you're creating a Maginot line, right? In, in the Verizon Data Breach Report, you'll see that data was encrypted 90% of the time in failures, right? So when there was a breach, hey, they were really compliant with these couple of things. Right, so you, you you cannot, and and so what we do is if we focus on one or two things and we just try and say or have these wonderful almost masturbatory sessions where we get up and we get all angry and and, and crazy, Arr! what's the outcome? 
It's anyway. Did you have like? I, this is not to be snarky, but was there a question coming? <laughs> I have a compensating control. But first, I want to compliment you on being polite because I wouldn't have said a symbiotic relationship. I think incestuous is a better choice of words. <laughs> I, I've been at a QSA re-up and had the tap on the shoulder when I use terms like that, so I try not to. Um, <laughs> Oh, but wait, that, that does point out one thing. The great thing about the council is the transparency. <laughs> <laughs> the point is, is that when we talk about new controls, there's an opportunity to really make an advancement in a control, and when the uh, control actually comes out, it's been watered down to the point where it's even more confusing than it was originally, or it doesn't do what it was originally intended, and I have concerns about that. If we're going to build a control set that is going to increase in effectiveness, we have to keep up with the times and we have to look at the process by which the control is performed and improve it based on previous experience. I don't see that happening. I actually see it sometimes. You can't put that on a checklist. That's, that's not a checklistable commodity because the QSA yeah. is not ever going to be the same. They don't take... Sorry, not you. They don't take good notes. They don't provide uh, transparency in terms of audit. You've got a bunch of people who are running around being assessors, play auditors, who don't have the training. They don't understand what an audit is. They're not licensed to do audits. And they're not performing an audit in such a way as it would provide you with any kind of useful experience. We call them audits, but they're not. No, we call them assessments. Not the people who are getting assessed. They call them audits. And they perceive them to have the same value as, you know, the really great audits like the SAS 70 Type 2. <laughs> There's no working papers to speak of. There's certainly not working papers that are transferred year to year from auditor to auditor. Uh, there's no comprehension of timeline. Uh, there's these point in time assessments that don't tell you what the real state of affairs are. They tell you what the state of affairs are for that day. And that day may be the one day when all the compensating controls work because Bob, Jimmy, and Fred all showed up that day. This is not a system that is geared towards the nature of continuous compliance or the nature of regular auditability or, or instant auditability. This is a system that is designed to do exactly and only one thing, and that's to create the appearance of. It's just wallpaper over that shitty dump. There's not much else you can say for it. A couple of observations on this. One that I look comes up to me regularly. In the security space, so we're here at DEF CON because we want to know what is out on the front edge. We want to share what we've found, and we want to be out on the front edge of exploitability, vulnerability, and those of us that are concerned with the defense side, we use that to arm ourselves, at least intellectually, with the battle we're up against. If I have an epiphany sitting here or at B-sides when somebody says something, and I just put my hand up and say, if I do this, will that stop that? And the answer is yes, and I'm going to go to market with this idea. If I'm lucky and it meets a checkbox so that I can get money, because my credit cards are all tapped out, uh, God knows my house isn't worth anything, so now I, I, need, to get, I, get a, I need to get venture money. Um, so I get all of that, I build a company. I get a team of people, I put it together. I got a product, how, how long? Two years? Two years to market, if I'm doing good? If it's a small product, it's six, eight months, but it's a very niche product. But let's say two years to market, and that's, that's great. Now there's something that I can prescribe and put on a checklist that you have to have, this new technology. I get tired of hearing people complain about the fact that PCI has a checklist. Well, the so well, let, me, let me just let me make but point. Just, the, the point there is that now for it to become part of a compliance mandate, it has to be mainstream and an, a, a technology or a, an approach to handling something that is accepted across the industry so that it can be prescribed, whether it's a checklist or whatever. So we're... Two, now three, formerly two, now three years out. So we're looking at a five-year cycle from one of us having a brilliant idea in this room. Well, not in this room, but you know, one of the other rooms. Um, and getting something that somebody is likely to tell us we need to defend our systems. Get, uh, I'm going to call you out. If it's not a checklist, where, where are the measurement scales? 
okay, maybe, maybe maybe you're right. It is a checklist. But the problem is, is the same people who are who are complaining about using it as a checklist, who are using it as a checklist and not going beyond it, are the same people that would have been looking and going, where can I find a checklist of best practices? The people who are the people who are in this room who are more experienced, who have actually had some time in the field, who are who are risk based or at least have the experience to know what the risks are, are actually going out and trying to go beyond and try and figure out how your controls can be shaped to meet the PCI requirements instead of just doing what PCI says. So that, that lower level uh, that uh, in the earlier slide, those are the people who a lot of them are the junior uh, um, Assessor, I mean, I'm sorry, junior assessors, junior administrators, and people who just haven't had the time, who are working in a, in a company where it's 200 people and three assistants, and that's the people who are doing the PCI. I think that there's just, it, it, people keep calling it a checklist and keep complaining about it instead of doing something and using it as a tool to make, to push management towards doing something. But meta compliance is hard. Yes, it is. It takes thought. Okay, but hold on. You, we cannot let this pass. You used the phrase best practices. So first he of all, did it first. Owl. He did it first. <laughs> Second of all, uh, this stuff has to be couched. We need to, instead of whining about it or you know, like we're doing on the panel here, um, it's not best practice. It's not even. It's barely good practice. It's just north of negligent, right? I mean, this Agreed. is. This, it, <laughs> yes, but at least we're. Catching the low-hanging fruit. Can we start throwing the <laughs> the phrases? Yeah, up? So, so we have raised the bar. It was zero feet high. High. Now it's two feet high. Um, so, did we waste two feet of fence? I don't know. But uh, this has to stay vibrant. I mean, one of the things is not up on the slide right now with the, that bell curve again, right? Where we had the negligent. One of the biggest epiphanies we had was uh, early in the debates on your podcast. I think. Uh, I think it was. Um, I was critiquing the efficacy of the security controls, because if you look at the digital dozen, they're really old, and I'm pretty sure anybody in this room could compromise a fully compliant network, because it's not a very high bar. And I said, you know, they can be trivially defeated by an amateur attacker. I think it was Mike Don who said, not if you do them right, right? Not if you use them right. And I had this like blinding flash of the obvious. I said, wait a second, these folks are so irresponsible and negligent that they have to be forced to do something to protect card data, and yet we, on the same time, think they're going to flawlessly execute this stuff. So I think hundred thousand merchants can do a better job of fixing the system bingo. than three card companies. So it, yeah, really, what it is is, uh, you know, I, I've been accused of this being a catchphrase, but I want the PCI Council and the standard to either better wield its power or yield its power. And I don't mean give up. What I mean is, if we had figured out through intelligent, rational debate that that community <laughs> called called the negligent will only do what they're forced to, then you can't get them eighty percent there or fifty percent there. You need to make that thing really vibrant, really current, really relevant. Keeping up with evolutions in threat, keeping up with evolutions in technology, keeping up with changes in business, and it's not doing that. So if we want to do it, let's do it. And if it's just a diffusal of blame and money, then let's call it what it is and let's not become lazy and complacent and just say, well, I'm going to do my audit work and then I'm done. I'm going to pretend I'm Dave Shackelford for a minute. Oh. Uh, how many of you are looking at tokenization or internet encryption, looking at something like what Heartland or some of the other companies are doing where you can buy a new POS and, and never actually have access to the credit card? Any of you out there looking at those? Not really. I mean, I look and I see a bar barely a handful of, of hands coming up. If you are not looking at tokenization, at end-to-end encryption, at other technologies, I hate to tell you this, you're at the lower end of the bell curve. If you're not looking ahead at some of these technologies that he's, had, he's talking about, you're at that low end of the bell curve because you need to be looking ahead and saying, what can I do beyond this? Because it's on you to fix the problem. Wait, it, it's, on, it's on those of us at the bottom end to do two things. If we care about security, we have to fix the problem, and we have to be compliant, too. Well, don't we have two budgets? Don't we have our compliance budget and that really, really big budget to secure our business? <laughs> right? But is there any money left once you pass the audit? So how do we change it? How do we That's put pressure on the PCA Council? How do we get involved in the SIGs? What do we do? So we're going we're gonna to shift gears for just a minute because we have, uh, we, we do need to look at how we move forward and not just having uh, an argument. And uh, we have some, 
Alex has some uh, thoughts on this, and it's good. I mean, PCI, there, there are a couple of different ways to look at PCI that are outside of just what we've been talking about now. So we got, we got folks lining up. Um, it, 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 do you have a quick question, or, or is this comments, or? It's, it's a little bit of both. Okay. Oh, I can wait. All right, that's oh, fine. I'm quick. All right, you're quick, go for it. Okay, so it's a rigged game, right? That's what you're saying. But how's it rigged? So how many people in the room, other than QSAs, have seen the QA checklist that QAs have to turn into the console? Raise your hands, right? Why is it that all these other people haven't seen it? Because it's not published, right? Okay, so people don't even know the checklist that they have to work against. We don't either. <laughs> we get feedback from the PCI Council and it changes from day to day sometimes. Oh yeah, well, okay, so I went to the first merchant training that they gave back in the spring and it was real interesting. I think they must have stock in Depends or something because that was the answer that they gave to pretty much everything. Well, it depends. All right, so um, Mike Dunn, who's, who's not here, um, I, I used to, it, it, okay, so real quick, who's kind of spun up about PCI in a negative way versus positive? Okay, so the rest of you are positive, or the rest of you are just like got pit stains and don't want to raise your hand? Or, um, I used to get real spun up about it. You know, I, I, Anton and, and Martin and Mike would have these Bias book. Yeah, Bias book. They would have these blog posts, and I'd be like, what sort of industrial solvents are you guys sniffing? You know, I, I, this makes no sense to me at all. And then Mike Don was actually good enough to come out and buy some sweet Korean uh, with me and uh, the guy who ran PCI for a, a large insurance company and so forth and I really kind of something clicked and that was uh it ain't going to change. You, you remember I said that we have three things. You know, first, is it the right thing to do? Well, right now, that's that's in the hands of politicians and bureaucrats, and we're not going to be able to change that. Second, is it the right thing to do in terms of securing a network? Although Allison Miller just uh, tweeted or texted and said, uh, you know, it's funny. It's not a network defense system. It's a card defense system. She's she's right. And the third thing is the right thing to do on a macrocosmic level. And we don't know and we're not even trying to know. And so what we need to do is get through basically our stages of grief and we need to get to the point where we're at acceptance, right? So uh, with, all, with all deference to Jeremiah who, who did this first, right? Denial is, I feel fine, this can't be happening, not to me. And we saw this, you know, DSW chose to take the fines for a while, I believe. Um, anger, why me? It's not fair, how can this happen to me? Who's to blame? Uh, you know, I'll do anything for a few more years out of bargaining, you know, well, can, can we delay this ex expenditure for a while? Um, you know, depression. I, we're, our industry really is probably unevenly distributed through one through four, right, depending on, on who the managers are. Where should we be, I think, is the point of acceptance, and that's kind of where I got to, and that's what might click with me, all right? So I might as well prepare for it. So what does acceptance mean to me? Um, folks might disagree with me, but I believe that, you know, the, the let's call it DSS, I'll just stick with that. It's a hypothesis, and, and E.T. James, um, if you're into logic and science and stuff, he has a great book, and he says, you know, basically all the models that we create, they're simply hypothesis, and they're built to be falsified, right? You apply scientific method, right? So, <laughs> Yeah, basically, my assertion is we have with how many how many merchants, James? Oh, a hundred thousand or so. Right. We essentially have a pretty good sample of networks. If you want to think about it in this way, we have the ability to establish control groups. We can do all sorts of studies. We can start doing something. That information is proprietary. Yeah, to we can the PCI Council. Uh, hey. Yeah, so I'm like trying to, to figure copy. We yeah, I could sell that to you. <laughs> you. You can buy a copy of all that data. It's, seriously, it's real cheap. That's excellent. Um, so, <laughs> but basically, our organizations, I know Trustwave put out a report. My employer puts out a report. I, I my, uh, along with Mike, I, I wrote the PCI section this year. Um, 
and I really think that as we look at our industry, we have two great things that we need to measure and figure out, right? And one is what we need, we need some sort of measurement scale for the strength of a control, right? It has to be a rational scale. It can't be one through ten. It can't be, you know, some ordinal scale. We can't multiply peanut butter by jet engine and get fast. It, you know, the world doesn't work that way, uh, even despite what our GRC programs say. And the second thing is, is how do we consistently measure a strength of an attack? Right? So if you look at PCI from a pure scientist's mind, stop being an engineer and say this is a bridge and how can we make the bridge stronger so that the next time a big truck comes over it we don't have to worry about it, but you actually look at it, at it more as a system or the entanglement of several complex systems, we actually have an opportunity. And as security professionals in a nascent industry and indeed a proto-science for Tom Kuhn, uh, uh, for those of you who are familiar with him, we have the opportunity to make a difference for generations beyond because the problem ain't going away, whether it's PCI, whether it's intellectual property, what have you. So what we need is some sort of revolution. And Jamie's right, we don't have transparency, but we do have the ability to actually share data, get together in groups with ISOCs and so forth, anonymize it, and get it out there and talk about what we see. That's our responsibility. That's something we can do besides sit in meetings on a Sunday at DEF CON when we're all freaking hung over and complain <laughs> about it. But math is hard. So an interesting point there um, about security in general, PCI in particular, and the way we approach it. It would be great for us to move um, towards the scientific method from the rhythm method that we're currently using. <laughs> um, we would like to close with some uh, thoughts on moving forward, but first I'd like to give this patient gentleman a chance to throw something at us. I forgot the rotten fruit this morning, sorry. Um, first, full disclosure, I'm the QSA. Um, I agree with Mr. So Arlen. Sorry. I agree with Mr. Arlen that it is getting it's it's transferring risk. My dad. What mer merchant response? It's tokenization, which is again getting rid of risk, right? So moving it somewhere else. PCI as a as a standard is not going to help companies that don't take security seriously to begin with, right? So any company that goes through and approaches it a checklist or does business with a QSA that sees this as a checklist approach, it's not going to help them. It never has, never will. Ten years ago, the stuff that's in PCI, I was telling companies that I worked for to do. They wouldn't do it, right? PCI, at least, gets them to do some of this stuff. Is it the best that we have? Don't know. We can, it can be better, certainly. But if you're working with a QSA, and the QSA is sticking the checklist. You need to get a better Q QSA. And as so for technologies, you can buy compliance? QSA can, can, QSAs can approve technologies, as it were, that don't fit the requirement. Antivirus, for example. PCI doesn't say anything about application whitelisting, but you can use that instead of antivirus, and it's a much more effective control. So if you're working with a QSA who can't think outside of the checklist, then get a new QSA. Okay, so we need to wrap up. We'll try to get to your question, so just hang on just a moment. I'd like to, uh, let me put my thought out on wrapping up, then we'll give it to the panel. What I would like to come out of this, my, my goals and uh, expectations are low. I would like people to have an informed opinion about what PCI is doing for and to you, and then have an informed conversation. That may mean that you can address the PCI working groups. It may mean that you can just inform your managers or your employees of what it does and doesn't mean. Who wants to kick off? So ultimately, this, every security conversation should, should end up talking about the zombie apocalypse, right? Yes. But, so a point of frustration is that this space changes constantly. I said it before, we have a static approach to a dynamic problem. I would just love us to become completely intolerant and impatient being stuck at good. I don't even think the standard is good anymore. It's gotten very stale. But let's just say it's good. Can we please start talking about what it better and best look like? Right? I mean, if there's a zombie uprising right now, I'm not going to defend myself in a straw house or a stick house. I'm going for the brick shit house. 
<laughs> the, but the point is, we've been stuck on this conversation for years now, and it does not look like they're going to change. So if they're not going to lead the way, then you need to. But there are there are improvements being made. I mean, you look at somebody like at a company like Visa, who is actually now starting to come back to the acquiring banks and say. We don't want you to have to make the merchants. We don't want you to require the merchants to retain credit card information. And actually, Visa is, is starting to, to make moves to say we will re require that you can't have your merchants retain credit card information. And I think that's really what we need to do. Jamie is perfectly correct in saying that it, it's a risk transference, and there's no reason for merchants to have all this information. Get rid of it. If you don't have a data retention that says is as soon as we can get rid of it, it's gone. Then, then you're just keeping stuff that's, that's putting you at risk, and, and that's one of the main things. Is, is I'm tired. <laughs> Jamie, you're next. I want you to push. I want you to push back against all of this crap because you can see that it's crap. I want you to say it's not good enough. It's not enough to just merely be compliant. Nobody wants to live in a house that's built to minimum building code standards. Why the hell are our computers the same way? Why are these machines no longer deterministic? Why are these systems predicated upon failure rather than predicated upon success? There is no reason that we should still be using a system that is entirely built to service the needs of one of those old-fashioned shik-shik machines rather than something that is real-time, current, capable, and useful. It's time for the system to be upgraded. PCI 2.0 should be the death of the 16-digit system because it's time. You should be going to your Congress critters, or if you're in another country, whatever you use for Congress critters, and you should be instructing them to do the damn right thing. Deal with the usury problem, deal with the racketeering problem. The quid pro quo for being a world currency is acting like a mature adult instead of a petulant four-year-old with fantasies of how the universe works. And I want, to, I want you to channel that emotion and push back in a rational, logical, and transparent manner. And that, that, is, that is, and to your comment, sir, you've got responsibility too. If you think a compensating control is sweet, great, publish it, put it out there. I got the freaking new school of security blog, it's all there, right? So do it, become rational, use that, use your minds. My gosh, you're a bunch of geeks. Use your minds as a weapon. But do it in a scientific method. It's hard to follow a statement like, use your mind as a weapon. <laughs> but, uh, you know, my, my thinking you, is... You have a weaponized mind, so let's hear what you have to say. <laughs> Kung Fu action. Um, I, I'm going to get a little more tactical, right? Because, I mean, no offense, dudes, but that's like... You know, let's all dance and sing and influence the politicians, and you know, good luck. But uh, you know, hi hypothetically, and I'm not disagreeing, right? I mean, I think it's messed up, just like everybody in this room does. But you know, my philosophy is, is more: what can I do? You know, like right in front of my face, right? What kind of things can I do? Right now, you know, you, you got most people that just want the auditor to go the hell away. Okay, I'm down with that, but what if you could use that opportunity to improve security in your organization? It's up, that's as much up to you as the you know, fight the power kind of rub that, that uh, you just heard from my, my co-panelists. So that, that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is, get, you know, get a QSA that is not just completely full of shit, um, right? <laughs> uh, that, that um, you know, so I'm a QSA. Right? You know, I mean, this you know, feels like an AA meeting, right? Welcome, Dave. Okay. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I have a very long background technically, right? So I, I was sitting through the QSA training, and it was crap. It was three days of um, one spiral-bound book that told me the right things to say when asked X, Y, and Z questions. And I took the test, and it was shit, right? It was easy. Every one of you could pass it, whether or not you had any real involvement in the auditing uh, you know, world or, or not. So here's what you can do today, right? Based on the thing I just said, yeah, based on the thing I just said, right, use this as an opportunity, get a QSA that is good. Interview them, ask them for a resume, right? Ask them hard questions. Read their blog. Right, right. So, we're going to go to you. We only have a couple of seconds. 
This is part of an ongoing conversation. I invite you to find us, continue the conversation, start the conversation, tell us we're full of crap. We already know that, but maybe we can agree on something. Uh, this all started on Twitter, and you can find all of us on Twitter. And with that, let's see how many we can get in. So... Um, for all the folks complaining that PCI is a checklist, um, yeah, get over it. It's like going to the amusement park. You must be this high to ride. It's a minimum standard. Um, this, this is a case of business negotiation. I'm sorry, wh the, where's your measurement you scale for whether it is a minimum or maximum standard? Sorry? Where's your measurement skill for that? You said it's a minimum standard. How do you know that it is a minimum? How do you know it's not a maximum? H have you met any kind of compliance that is not a minimum standard? Well, yes. no. You don't have a measurement right. scale. You're, right? It's like best practices. In order to say this is best or minimum, you have to say this is not best or not minimum. If you can't, if you don't meet it, you get fined or you can't participate in the system. That's a true It's a minimum statement. standard. So one of the so, things that we haven't really touched on is the way we use tools. Um, I live in Massachusetts, Lynn Ladder. If you buy a new ladder from Lynn Ladder Company, it's completely covered with labels and they get sued if people misuse their tool. Uh, one ACI is misused for security and they are they're using it for things it wasn't designed for. One more quick observation. The reason we haven't made it through the five stages of grief is because this is a business negotiation. Retailers through, for example, the National Retail Federation have an opportunity to fight back and influence and change the standard. And depending on your perspective, you might be fighting to water it down or you might be fighting to make it more clear. So that's fight. that's why we're in it, but and fight. yes, we need to be we need to be fighting to make it better, more clear, etc. And right. by the way, I completely agree. We need to get the heck away from pan and other published data, cool. things that are printed on cards that we use to identify ourselves. Thank you all very much. We want to make sure the next uh, group gets to up on the stage. So thank you all. We will uh, be Thanks. taking questions. Yep.